We will do a dynamic simulation. Go back to the slides here. Before we go to the dynamic, sure. you had something like the imperial fault where the, there's like the upper, let's say kilometer, it's like creep, you know, has episodic little, little events. So it's a very different coefficient of friction. Is there any problem? You make a, you make a shallow layer, then you make a deeper one with kind of the normal fault. So if you uh, have, uh, have a fault surface and put a spatial distribution of, uh, say, the static coefficient of friction or the dynamic coefficient of friction, you would get some events occurring in um, parts of the fault that, uh, that lo help load the other fault. And so that's sort of what, for rate and state friction, that's often done is we have this uh, difference between A minus, you have the A minus B is sort of a parameter where you go from stable sliding regions into unstable sliding regions. In the stable sliding, you're going to have con generally continuous creep going on that help load the rest of the fault. And usually uh, when uh, you'll, the stresses build up around uh, the edges of those creeping regions, and that's where uh, when you do that d dynamically, that's where the rupture nucleates and it spreads. So Nadia Lapusta yeah, um, and others have done a lot of simulations showing um, how these creeping regions are often, you know, uh, the interaction between different creeping regions and the size of those cre creeping regions can affect the dynamics of the, the fault rupture. Um, Oops. Okay, so on the, uh, let's see, do I, okay, so for the, uh, sh this is going to be a case where we're going to take shear waves and a big, long, thin bar. So this is, this bar is eight kilometers long by 200 meters wide. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to generate, our fault is going to be here in the middle. We're going to uh, generate shear stresses on this fault. It'll overcome friction, and then we'll send a shear wave down. And at these green boundaries, we've put absorbing boundaries that perfectly absorb shear waves. So the, so the shear wave goes into the, into the end. It's perfectly absorbed like the bar is infinite long, and so we won't get a reflection back. And what's interesting about this case is that uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to have an just basically the shear stress will go to a dynamic value on the fault um, and then what's going to happen is that the shear wave will come down at the boundary it won't be won't be reflected back and so we'll develop a shear strain in the bar there'll be a velocity the traction at the end is proportional to velocity so uh, we will have a traction here at the end that is proportional to velocity. It'll end up being the traction that is equal to whatever we are in the bar, and then we have a, the velocity here that uh, has to be matched by uh, the traction at the end. So basically, what we are going to do is we're going to distribute this middle interface fault will keep sliding, the, ball, the bar will be deformed, and the ends will keep moving. And here's what the traction time history that we're going to put on here in the middle is. It's going to start out at 75, and then it's going to come up over a period of time. So we, ha we can only resolve, we need about 10 points per wavelength, so 10 grid cells per wavelength of the shear wave. So we want to do a nice smooth initial traction, get it above the threshold required to slip, and then the faults will start slipping. Uh, there are four different cases. Um, that you can run static friction, slip weakening, and the rate and state model. And these examples are in examples bar shear wave quad four. Uh, and this is how we run it. So let's go over to that directory bar shear wave quad four. So uh, we run pilot spontaneous rup.cfg spontaneous rup static friction. And one of the, we'll let this run, and we'll look at the, what those files look like. 
So examples, bar shear wave quad four. So let's start with the Pyleth app file. So we'll turn it, we have turn on our journals. Um, we have a mesh IO qubit. We have a 200 meter resolution grid. Uh, our bar is, sorry, eight kilometers by 400 meters by 400 meters. Now in this case, we're using explicit time stepping, no elastic pre-step. Our non-dimensionalizer is gonna be a non-dimension elastic dynamic. So the other one is a quasi-static non-dimensionalization. And instead of a length scale, a relaxation time, and a density, in this case, it's a shear wave speed, the frequency of the waves that are traveling, and the dense, and I think it's the density. So in this case, I'm non-dimensionalizing by, non by a shear wave speed of one kilometer per second. Uh, my boundary conditions, I'm gonna have at the ends, the X positive, X negative, and then I wanna force the shear, the beam to behave in shear only, so I don't permit all of the points on the fault, I don't permit X degree, X displacements. So if you, these beams would start to behave like a bending beam if I put, if I didn't have this um, in there. So I have a fault, my materials is gonna be elastic, I'm gonna run for 12 seconds, a time step of 0.05 seconds, and that has to be the CFL condition, the stable time step is the, the wave should not be propagating across the dimension of the cell in, within one time step. So our P-wave speed divided by the dimension of the cell gives us a rough estimate of the stable time step. We're going to do elastic plane strain, uh, material properties. I've increased the uh, numerical quadrature because we have a mass matrix in this case. Absorbing dampers, this is a new boundary condition that we haven't used before, so our ends are using absorbing dampers boundary condition. The value of the, of the damping coefficient is based on the material properties, specifically the shear wave speed to uh, perfectly absorb the shear waves. And so uh, we actually have to give the material properties of our domain to those boundary conditions. And let's see, do that same for the other bar. Um, and then our displacement, we want to pin all X degrees of freedom for vertices that aren't on the faults. Uh, let's see, interface is fault. Uh, we, all we give it is, in this case, uh, this is just the generic Pyleth app, given ID label and the quadrature. Notice that we don't have any Petsy solver parameters because we don't need uh, with explicit time stepping, we have a diagonal mass matrix, so our solve is trivial. It's a diagonal matrix, and so we don't use any of the Petsy solvers um, for this uh, problem. And our output writer, I changed the format, so let's look at spontaneous.cfg. Setting up our initial conditions, so here we set the type of fault to the dynamic fault. Here, our initial stresses is gonna be 75 megapascals of right lateral, 120 compressive, um, and then we're gonna put, put a perturbation of 20 megapascals of right lateral shear stress. So here's our perturbation. Initial, initial stresses are in a uniform database, so right lateral is negative, so 75 in the shear, in this case, we're 2D, so our fault is 1D, so all it has is a shear traction and normal traction. And then the perturbation is a 25 megapascal in shear, nothing in normal. We're gonna not, we're gonna change, we're gonna start this perturbation at a time of zero. And then the time history of that traction is in this file called traction change time dot time uh, db. So this is a, before we've been using only spatial databases, so databases that gave values a function of space, this is a time database, basically giving a functional form of a time history as a, fun as, a fun as a function of time for a bunch of points. So traction 10 TB has a very simple header, it basically has the number of points and then the units of time. And so the first column is time in seconds in this case, because the time units, let me 
increase the size of that. And then this is just a non-dimensionalized amplitude. So we started at zero and then we went all the way up to 15 seconds. So our simulation is going from zero to 12. And so zero to 15, all of our time steps will be inside of that. Uh, if you exceed this value, I think it just takes the last time value it sees. Um, and then the, so the amplitude of where it's getting that information, it's going to take the time history in that file and multiply by minus 25 megapascals and add that to the tractions on the fault. And the output, we're going to get slip, slip rate, and traction. So the problem ran. And you'll notice that in the output, uh, you don't see any of those Petsy uh, residual evaluations because we're not using Petsy. So it's just marching through uh, a lot of time steps very quickly. So let's load up in pair view. Bar shear wave, static friction, here are the values. So there's our bar. Here's our mesh on that bar, very simple. Bunch of quads, we'll color it by, we'll color it by velocity. And rescale it by data range. Let's warp it by a factor of, uh, let's do 500. Go back to surface with edges. So here I'll play this movie. Whoops. Uh, 50. <laughs> so there, this is what, and there it goes off the screen. Maybe we'll do 20. There we go. So let's restart it again. Uh, so there you see we've started to slip and the shear wave is propagating down and leaving essentially behind it a uniform shear stress field. And now we have a, a damper on the end that is feeding back attraction proportional to the velocity. We have uh, the shear stress within the bar transmitting that traction to the end. And so the, given how much we've, we're driving the shear stress, um, so the value that we're driving the shear stress minus the friction um, is equal to the shear stress in the bar, and the speed at which the bar is moving is related to taking that traction and dividing by the damping coefficient here at the end that's proportional to velocity. So you can actually compute based on the difference in traction what the shear stress in the bar is going to be, and then how fast it's moving uh, based on the damping coefficient at the end. And so this, this is steady state behavior. You can see our velocity. Um, here I can, you can, I can uh, rescale it, and you'll see our velocities are basically uh, one point, or sorry, they're 11 point, about two meters per second. Um, Plus or minus, there's some. There's a little chitter chatter as a result of the because we can't constrain the uh, the x degrees of freedom for the fault. The fault sort of moves like this as it's moving away, but the rest of the x degrees of freedom are constrained. And, and so if I go back in time and play a little bit more, if I stop at about here and rescale. Uh, no, I want to do it before the wave gets to the end. So rescale here. Now if I replay it. So here I start at zero velocity. You can see the velocity quickly hits a sort of a steady state. And then as it propagates, it's basically propagating a steady state velocity, steady state solution of the tractions on the fault surface. And that's the static coefficient of friction. If I have uh, slip weakening, uh, I'll get a higher velocity because I'll, if I start with the same static friction as I drop uh, the coefficient of friction on the fault, um, there's a bigger driving stress and so there'll be less, uh, there'll be more shear strain in the bar and it'll drive at a fa faster velocity. Rate and state friction, I think the coefficient of friction doesn't drop as much and so it's a slower velocity. 
Um, there's a, to really run a 3D problem dynamics with the fault friction, you need a cluster to run on. And the meshes usually have tens of millions of cells in them. Um, so we don't have those within the pilot distribution. We have a different repository where we run a lot of the SCEC benchmarks that have a whole, I don't know, there's probably not, there's probably 10 or 15 benchmarks in there. Some of them um, are relatively updated for the current version of Pilot. Some of them, things dealing with fault edges, I haven't gotten around to updating those. Um, generally, this, those SCEC benchmarks, there's sort of two new benchmarks every year, and so the latter ones have been updated more recently than the very original ones that were done 10 years ago. Um, so that's sort of all I have for the fault friction. Um, are there any other questions? Or questions on doing dynamics with, uh, with Pilot? Okay, so the rest of the afternoon we have open for tinker time. So hopefully you guys can make good progress uh, advancing your knowledge of Pilot. And then tomorrow morning, um, Charles will, your Charles will do meshing. So Charles is going to do a 3D subduction zone yeah. mesh. And then sizing function. So Qubit has the ability to, um, instead of marking each curve with a size, you can generate a mesh and then uh, write out that Exodus file and then populate that Exodus file with sizing information. So you can, you can uh, and we have examples of doing that as a sort of a function, a couple different uh, an analytical function of space and then also so sort of a distance from a point saying what this uh, discretization size should be and then we also have one that's sort of mimicking a seismic velocity model where there's a discretization, finer discretization near the surface grading the mesh down to a quarter, a coarser resolution at the bottom um, and so then you can come up with very complex variations of, spatial variations of cell size as a function of location within your mesh. Now, uh, for like hex meshes, qubit can't just arbitrarily change sizes of cells in a hex mesh. It has to do these very specific uh, structured transitions in, in cell size. Whereas for tetrahedra, it can do these uh, spatial variations. However, it can't adjust, you can't have a meter resolution here and right next to it have a 10 kilometer resolution. You need sort of a smooth transition between the two. So there's certain uh, sort of restrictions on that. Um, but that's sort of one of those features that you can do in qubit that's in many measures is not available. Um, and uh, so we've, we've experimented with that and we have examples. And then the subduction zone will be non-planar faults. Um, and then after Charles talks about meshing, Matt's gonna talk more about solvers. Um, and give you some idea of all sort of the different types of solvers that Petsy has and some of the, the options uh, for adjusting them and playing around with them.